Welcome to episode 370 of the AMPM podcast. Got a really good one for you today. Speaking with Frankie Thorogood from the UK, we're talking about branding, building brands, advertising, a lot of cool topics in this discussion. I think you're going to really get some good value from it and really enjoy it. Enjoy this episode with Frankie. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. Welcome to the AMPM podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host. Kevin King. Kevin King. What's up, Frankie? Frankie Thorogood, the guest on the AMPM podcast today. How are you doing, man? Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin the King. The King is here, and we're all just here to learn from him. It's good to be the King, you know? It's good to be the King. It's good um, to be in the presence of King, of the King and royalty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we, we met, uh, what, at, at Danny's event, right? Uh, Seller Sessions back in uh, May earlier this year, I think it was? Correct. Correct. Yeah. A lot of people may not uh, know about you. You're based over in the UK. Are you in London proper or are you outside of London? I am in very much the heart of London. If you listen carefully, you might hear a siren. <laughs> I hear it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I am right in the middle of Camden. Camden's quite famous. Uh, people, uh, you know, international people might recognize it. It's famous for live music. It's got a lot of history of like punk, rock and roll. So yeah, that's where I live, right in the middle of Camden town. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, London's a, a cool place. I've been, I don't know, probably nine, 10, 11 times over to London. It's always a cool, very diverse uh, city. I used to remember my father used to love to go to the bookstores there back before you could buy stuff on Amazon. Uh, I think the first time I went to London, I was in my 20s and my father was making his, one of his semi-annual trips to go to London just to buy books. And I went with, oh, him. Wow. I went with him to London and he would just go and spend like four days just going in, uh, in, in all the bookstores because he could get books that in English. He's an avid reader and that he couldn't find in bookstores in the U.S. Uh, so he, he now he you know, doesn't need to do that. You can get pretty much anything online. Uh, but yeah, that, I remember those days. That was back in the, uh, the 90s. Well, there's a sweet certain irony to that, isn't there, considering what we're all up to these days with Amazon? <laughs> it, is, it is. It is. It's, it's, it's kind of like it's. Yeah, it's almost like a full circle there. But there's a lot of really good books. And I've, you know, Gorilla Market has been books that have really changed my outlook on things in the past, but it's just just time. Um, but so I chose instead of spend like you do the few hours a day reading an actual book, I read more newsletter, short form type of stuff. Mm, mm. Yeah, it, it, sometimes books, you know, there's a lot to say about it. But like, you know, sometimes if you get a good one, it's a long game. Uh, and, and it's a slow burner and sometimes they change your life uh, over time or they change your business over time as well in ways that it's not quite easy to pinpoint. The newsletter style is like, boom, here's a point. I'm going to action it tomorrow. I can test yeah. the results next week. Uh, so I think, you know, we're going to talk about some stuff that I've done in the past and a lot of the stuff I feel like that's made me successful has been a little bit counterintuitive. And I would argue that like there might be let's say a gap in the market, or it might be an opportunity for people like us to try and force ourselves to engage with some of the longer form stuff out there for that purpose, because no one else, maybe other people are missing it. Maybe it can, uh, for example, I read, I read uh, advertising books. Um, and, you know, just marketing stuff in the, in the broad sense, brand marketing, right? I'm reading at the minute, uh, the 22 immutable laws of marketing. I've read that. that. that that's, that's the book. I actually like three or four years ago, I actually read it cover to cover Yeah, because it's, it's, it's those chapters are short to the point And like, it's, it's like good quality stuff. Uh, but that's a really good book for those of you listening that if you haven't checked out that I highly just, just like he did, Frankie just did, I, I highly recommend you, you check that out. Yeah, it's like a classic, right? I mean, it's so old that like half the examples are about, you know, the internet didn't exist when this book was written. <laughs> so you're not going to find. But that's you know, a good point. That's a really good point. It's like everybody now, there's a lot of young people in the, in, in the e-commerce business in their 20s, early 30s. I don't know what your age is, but I'm an older guy. I'm in my 50s. Uh, so it's everybody's like, oh, there's this cool new technique that we're doing now. And I'm like, that's there's nothing new about that. 
That's like <laughs> it's the same thing that people were doing 70 years ago. And just now it's in a different medium. It's on, it's on meta or it's in uh, an email or it's, it's just a different form, but it's the psychology uh, stays the same. And I always tell people if they're going to read books, if you're, if you're in the e-commerce business, some of the best stuff you can do is read marketing psychology because mm. that doesn't human behavior doesn't change the medium or the meth, the, the delivery of the message may change, but uh, the delivery mechanism of the message, but the psychology of human behavior doesn't really change that much. Yeah, I I, mean, I agree. People say we've got short attention spans now. Talk about like TikTok, you know, advertising, like who, that hasn't changed either. We haven't rewired the human brain in the last 10 years. Uh, you no. still have to get someone's attention in the first three seconds, the same as you used to when there was three TV channels or there was no TV and it was just a newspaper. You have to, you know, it hasn't changed either. So um, there's a lot to be said for studying some of the old masters. Ogilvy, uh, yeah, Ogilvy yeah. on advertising is like, that guy, you know, he he was a copywriting genius. People talk about writing their copy for Amazon. I still write all my own copy. Every bullet point, every title, every A+, plus, every product description, I still write it. I wrote it for, for the old brands up until the very, very end. Even once we'd sold it, <laughs> I still, I was like, no, I want to approve the copywriting. So these are, these are like, you know, like yeah, whatever, like old school skills. They haven't changed. You can learn a lot from, from some of the old masters as well. And Have you seen also, the- you seen a newsletter? Speak, speaking of that, uh, the old Ogilvy stuff. Have you seen uh, a newsletter called The Ad Professor? It's a British guy that actually puts this out. It's a he puts it out, I think, twice a week. But he analyzes all the old ads, all the old Ogilvy ads. You know, the I sat down at the piano and everybody listened or whatever. You know, all the famous ones, and then he, <laughs> he he finds the current ones, the, all the top ads that are working really, really well uh, currently, and he. he I don't know where he's getting all this stuff, but they're, they're amazing. And just to see, you know, he'll do like 20 of them each week. Here's 20 things that are just really creative, really cool that are working out there right now. And, and he pulls them from all kinds of different places. And it's, it's really good because it gives you ideas and inspiration. Like, man, if I applied this to what I'm doing or take this little section, do this little section, it just creates that everything that's old, everything that's old is new again. And there's hardly any new ideas out there. There's nothing really novel and new. And for the most part, it's, it's just a re, repackaging. Uh, and some of the best things you can do is copy smart. Oh, yeah, for sure. Why are you trying to reinvent the wheel for? These guys have been doing this for decades. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's the ad professor you said? It's coming from a newsletter at marketingplug.com. Marketing plug. But he does all the counter stuff. Like, I never read The Economist as an ad. You know, or he does, a, you know, like he has a ad, shows an ad for a Porsche. It's a, it's a, from Porsche and Porsche, it's, they're showing like a 911 and they're saying, uh, whoever, what's the tagline? It's like, whoever, dream, did you dream of uh, owning a, a Hyundai one day when you were a young child or did you dream of owning a Porsche? And I just, it's really cool. <laughs> really, I can't Steve. <laughs> yeah, really cool stuff like that. Or there's one that just, uh, when Twitter rebranded to uh, X, uh, he, it was the World, Live, World Wildlife Federation, I think it was, you know, Save the Animals. Or Peter, or one of those save the animals kind of plays. So they showed the the Twitter. They showed like a little bird, like a little chick, like a little baby chick. Then they showed the first Twitter logo, the next Twitter logo, the next Twitter logo, the next mm. Twitter logo, and then they put that they and they put an X, and then they the tagline was uh, you know we're here to save the save the wildlife or something like that. Uh, you know it was really clever. Uh, so he, mm-hmm. he finds that kind of really cool stuff and then he breaks them down on mm. on what they're doing it's, it's it's really good you know like but when I, I did a marketing degree right that was what i thought i wanted to do at university yeah <laughs> but then you know so i actually applied to to every ad agency in london you know like to for a job in an ad agency and they, these guys hardly pay anything and they all, every single one of them rejected me um and i always got to the final stage the final interview stage and then they would they would reject me. And I can remember sitting in them. I, I was really passionate about advertising. I love the psychology element of it. It's basically sales, you know, like it's, it's say, you know, I used to say that my interviews, like for me, advertising is like sales. You have to understand the other person and try to persuade them that your product or service is what they need. I don't think the advertising industry liked hearing that because they're a bit too pretentious. <laughs> but I um, But I used to sit there and look at the brands that they were marketing for. And I used to just think, I would like to work on the advertising campaigns for these brands, but you know what I would love even more is to own one of the brands and and drive the advertising for my own brand myself. And I feel like 
you know, like used to come through, they could kind of sense that I wasn't, my heart wasn't quite in it. And so that's why I ended up, you know, unemployed with my degree, <laughs> ended up getting into the marketplaces game. So yeah, so talk about that. So you, you tried to, you graduated university, tried to do uh, advertising, didn't work out. So you said, the heck with this, I'll just build my own brand, doing my own. And that's what you're one of your big skill sets and what you're known for is branding and, and really crushing it. You're crushing it with a, a, a couple different brands on, on that front of, of your own. Graduated university and then did you go straight into like, okay, I'm just going to develop a product and start doing like some D to C stuff or did, or what did, what were you doing? I was desperate to start a business. I was like, I love business. You know, I want to get involved, but I didn't have an idea. I didn't know what to do. And, and this, this is, is what, about, about 13 years ago? This is, yeah, 2012. Okay, 10 years. Uh, okay, cool. 11 Just, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, and um, the way I got started was this is going to be a niche uh, reference. For UK people will get this. UK people that follow football, i.e., soccer, will get this. But footballers started wearing a snood. And What's what that? the snood is, is a piece of uh, warm thermal fabric that goes around your neck like a scarf, but it's uh, connected at both ends. So you pull it over your head. And this footballers would wear this to keep their neck warm while they're playing football. Now, this, this is interesting for a few reasons. N number one, the snood was vilified. It was very famous because footballers are famous and everybody follows the Premier League. And you've got more and more foreign players and more and more of this narrative that football is becoming too soft, right? Like football players are just diving all the time. There's no contact anymore. Like they, they feel now they're feeling too cold. They need to wear a neck warmer. So this whole narrative in the well, media. It's kind of like they're, they're a bunch of pussies or something now or something. It, exactly. I mean, that's that hasn't really even gone away, but that was that narrative was very strong back then. And so snoods were very famous and they were getting covered in the media and stuff. And I wanted to wear one because I play football on Sunday morning, Sunday league football, which is very brutal. It's barely football. It's basically just going to war. And I really wanted to wear one because I thought it would it would annoy my opponents. I thought if I was running around the pitch wearing a snood, they would they would be like attack him because he's weak. You know what I mean? And I I love that. I just love winding up my opponents, and it gives me more power. So I was like, let me get a snood because I want to wind people up basically. And guess what? I could not find a snood in this whole country. I I could not find. What were the, the football players getting them? I, you know what? I've never, I've actually never worked that out. Um, I don't know where they were getting. They must have had some international supply chain that I wasn't aware of. So, because I was, I, there was basically two places you could go shopping back then uh, for sports, you know, sports apparel, uh, Sports Direct and JD Sports in in the UK. So I went to I went to both of those, and neither of them sold football snoods, and I was shocked. I was like, I cannot believe this because I can't be the only one that's going to try going to try and buy one at the minute. So there we go. What, what do we have? We have a surplus of demand and a lack of supply. Boom, that's a business idea. And so that's what I did. I went to Alibaba. And in those days, you know, like Alibaba, people didn't even, it was relatively new itself. People actually didn't even know about that. Um, I went, ended up on Alibaba. I ordered some snoods. And in fact, what I tried to do with them was I walked around Oxford Street again, like in London, the famous shopping street. And in those days, you used to have a bit more independent stores everywhere that would sell like luggage and like, you know, a bit of clothing and stuff like that. I went up and down Oxford Street and I went up to all the owners of these stores and I made deals of them. I said, I'm bringing in football snoods. Everybody knows what they are. No one's selling them. I'm going to bring them in. I can't remember what the prices were, but like, I'll bring them in for one pound. I'll sell them to you for three pounds and you can sell them for five pounds or something like that. And people, people were interested. I made deals on paper while I was waiting for the goods to come in from China. Were these licensed with the teams on them or just straight, just simple colors or something? The most unbranded piece of generic fabric you've ever seen. <laughs> like, so you can see where the story might end up going because of that fact. Uh, but no, no licensing, no nothing, not even like any unique design at this stage. It was just like order, you know, the first, uh, I had a hundred pounds. I had a hundred pounds of savings money. Um, and I invested it all in snoods. And um, when I waited for them to come in, I, I, I cut all these deals. What happened then was I met somebody through my uh, family friend who had been selling accessory phone accessories on eBay. Again, 2012, Amazon Marketplace barely existed. eBay was actually the place you would go to if you wanted to, like, you know, 
uh, do a marketplace business. And he was like, don't go to these shops. That's just like old fashioned. You should be selling this on the internet use, and you can use eBay to get straight to market very easily. So I, though that's what I did. And if it wasn't for that one conversation, you might see me today doing deals with retail, high street retail stores rather than doing anything to do with online. But that one conversation changed everything. And I said, fine, let's just stick them on eBay. The irony of it was the margin actually ended up no better once you take into account the marketplace fees, the shipping, and so on. Uh, so the margin is probably going to be stronger if I just give the shops. The reach is going to be higher. Yeah, You're, yeah, of course, yeah. And, and you know, I'm not. I don't regret it. So, so that's how I got started. I got. Uh, I was set the first person in this country to sell snoods. I ended up selling snoods to footballers because I guess they had the same problem as me. Some of the other ones couldn't find where to get them. Uh, I sold them to like so basically what, what, every country in the world. You get order on eBay from like some uh, famous footballer, and you're like, you're checking your orders as and your emails like, holy cow, so and so. David Beckham just ordered one or whatever, whoever, whoever it may have been. You're like, no way. You're like. Yeah. Yeah. But I wasn't even surprised at this point. Who just ordered one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wasn't even surprised at that point because everybody wanted a snood and I was the only one who had them. So, um, so that was how, how I got, that's up, how how I got started. Up selling? I mean, how, Honestly, how, how did that yeah. end up doing in the end? I, I wish I could remember the numbers, but you know, when you, when you get into business, I can remember the day I sat there on new year's Eve and my phone made a dinging noise and it said, ding, 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 you've sold an item. Congratulations. And that, that still to this day is one of my highlights of my entire business career <laughs> was selling that first snood. And I was just like, oh my God, we got something. We got something here. And uh, I don't know how many snoods I sold, but what I do remember was uh, I ran out of stock and I, I wasn't um, bullish enough and I didn't order more stock in time. So, you know, I had to keep waiting for it. That was a mistake I learned from, which I corrected later. At the time, it, it felt like I was a millionaire from snoods. The reality is it was going to be like in the, you know, the, the low thousands or, you know, I don't know exactly how many. Um, but it didn't last long because, as I mentioned, it's like an unbranded, there's no differentiation. Anyone else can go and find out where to source these. And of course, what you end up in is a price game, which is everyone's, you know, n- nightmare on the marketplaces. It's obviously the big downside of using them. Uh, and on top of that, you know, it was a bit of a craze, you know, like a like fidget spinners would be another recent craze that everybody would be aware of. It wasn't going to last forever. It wasn't a sustainable business model, which I knew. Um, but it was what, what got my foot in the door in terms of selling anything, got me a foot in the door of selling online. And it got my foot in the door of sportswear, which is then how I then developed what became the sportswear brands that we that we built for the next nine years um, and eventually sold. So what what kind was that clothing sportswear clothing brands or accessory brands or what kind of what what kind of stuff was it? Yeah, so uh, you know athletic sportswear. So like in the, I think we in the UK sportswear means you know like uh, actual you know athletic apparel that you're going to go and do a sport in. I think sometimes in the US it's used to mean like a bit more casual casual yeah, wear as be, well. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was. Um, so the next product that I did was compression wear. So uh, compression compression sportswear was invented by Under Armour. Uh, and it didn't really, I think they did it in 2008 or something. There's a good story about, about how they created that. And it started to become, um, commoditized and like, uh, compression wear started to become popular. And again, I was one of the first people in the UK to have like, a you know, like a independent, um, compression wear, uh, offering. So that was the well, first like product. Compression we did. These are like, like people know, like compression socks and stuff, or these, or these more compression, like shirts and things for yeah. like, or, okay. Yeah, so you'll see it if you watch athletes these days, you know, like underneath the team jersey, they'll have something else on like a long sleeve top, very tight, or some long, uh, some sh- uh, shorts underneath there, you know, like the team kit. So that's compression wear. So yeah, Under Armour, what, yeah, I remember they had big ads during like uh, American football games here where they'd show the guys all in these like really tight black shirts yes. or something and, and uh, hype and how it made their performance better and all kinds of stuff. So what, what is it actually, what is, for those that don't know, what is the compression where people know it for like the foot, you know, that's a popular item. Uh, and that, that's to help blood circulation in your feet, you know, keep you from getting clots and stuff down your feet. So as people age, a lot of times they need, or they're diabetic or whatever, they need compression socks. But when it comes to different parts of the body, like the arms and the chest and stuff, what is it actually really doing there? Well, there was, there was, there was studies done on it. Um, the, the benefits of, 
the the main benefit would have been during the winter and it's for warmth so it keep it will keep you warm which we need here usually not now now we're desperate for cold but yeah so like a big a big part of the compressed wear market is like okay i'm gonna go play football on sunday morning i'm freezing i want to wear something underneath right and it's lightweight it wicks so one of the benefits wicks the sweat from the skin so you're not drenching yourself in sweat so like an outer jersey or like a t-shirt like this if you get it's going to sweat on it it'll become very heavy and wet with sweat where the compression layer would sit underneath and it would wick the sweat away which means like uh, take it from the skin and then it absorbs on the surface of the fabric and you could actually see that you could see it happen like uh if you put it on a wet surface it would come to the top of the fabric evaporate off and then you know save you from being drenched in sweat so it was the sweat wicking it was the keeping you warm uh and yeah there was a there you know like in, in compressing the muscles um a lot of like people that wore it just enjoyed the feeling of feeling like they were locked in and their muscles were like you know being supported more so there were some benefits there as well uh it's been it's been um it's been a good three four years since i wrote a copy for this kevin so you're really testing me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that was that was what we did that was so that was the, the next big how many different skews well, how many different you said you did it for eight or nine years uh, before you sold it how many different skews did you have around this uh, honestly you got dealing I think, with sizes and you're dealing with all kinds of crazy stuff right yeah which is like you know um everybody's worst nightmare these days, you know, too many SKUs, too many variations. I think we had, we definitely had more than 2000. Uh, I think, honestly, I think it might've been at 5,000 at one point uh, before we called, we called a lot of it, but you know what? Like we didn't, it didn't bother us. Like we didn't have to find that problem. Um, Were you, did you have a big warehouse in, in, in London there with this or, or did you have that you owned or managed or did you job this out to a fulfillment company? Yeah, I um I remember the day that I shipped everything off to the fulfillment um what was they called fulfillment company um the th- yeah the three PL um I remember the day I did that it was like wow like my life has changed because I spent my entire day packing things and then running to the post office but yeah I I, I did my research so um what your recent newsletter uh, or I think it might be a recent podcast episode is talking about making profits at the buying side rather than the selling side right something like that. Yeah, and, and that was one of the lessons I was taught earlier is you, is you don't make your money when you sell. You make your money when you buy. So you need to buy right, yeah? Don't skimp on that. Um, and the same goes for all your service providers. So what I didn't do was go to the biggest, flashiest website, FreePL, uh, who's charging me more just to like give me some account manager or something that I don't need and pay their salary. I, I scoured the you know the country for the most cost effective um, free PL that I could find. And also someone who was small enough that we would get the service that we felt we needed. Um, and, and that's what I did. And, and I ended up working with these guys and um, you asking me like, if I wanted to, uh, you know, talk about anything particular, I, to be honest, these guys really deserve a shout out. They're called PacSmart. UK, uh, UK like people can look them up. They're in near Coventry, based near Coventry, which is in the Midlands, which is where most of our warehouses are in this country because obviously including the name, it's in the middle. They can ship everywhere quickly. Uh, but PacSmart is run by this guy, Nick, and uh, um, this lady, Shauna. And yeah, like that changed my whole life working with them, finding them. And I went through so many and I, and I, I chose who I thought was the best combination of value and service. And it really made a difference because you've got that many SKUs, right? And and with orders going wrong, they're giving the wrong size or the wrong color. It can happen a lot easier. So it was really important that we picked a good one. And and those guys were amazing. So were you selling D to C or were you also selling like on, still on, on eBay? And did you go onto Amazon and other places or in getting into doing a wholesale into like any of those those two big uh, sporting good companies? Or what were you we doing? Did it, we didn't. I constantly got asked about um, wholesale orders or like, you know, doing some bulk stuff. And I just think a lot of people might relate to this now. Like if we've got, if we start a successful brand, you start to get approaches for these things. So one of the new brands that I'm running now, we got approached by like a very famous, um, department store in the UK, like kind of prestigious place. And I was just like, to can I be bothered to like send you 50 units and just like deal with all of your old fashioned ways of working. And of course there's some upsides, but like I could spend my hours a lot better than doing this deal with you. So it was, it was the same back then with this, with the sportswear. We always had people asking about it, but like, I just felt the growth of the business was going to be online. And, um, 
direct to consumer or, or via the marketplaces and not not in this wholesale thing. I just wasn't set up for that. So I'm glad we never did it. Amazon tried to do it as well. I tried to buy us like, you know, do a retail deal, which we we luckily never did because that sounded like hell. So um, it was mainly eBay for, for a long time. And then some people start to try and convince me like you should check out Amazon. And I was just like, oh, I cannot be bothered. Have you seen the state of these flat files? I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna waste my time filling out a thousand cells. And like, you know, I have to go for like approval for it and all this stuff. I was like, I forced myself to do it. Um, and, and of course the rest is history. eBay, eBay was still doing half a million or something in sales. Um, the last time I checked, I mean, we stopped checking it a long time ago <laughs> with the old business, but it was, t- we had such powerful listings on eBay that they were just turning over like, like, you know, hundreds of thousands, but, but yeah, you know, as soon as I got on Amazon, Amazon itself started to grow and we grew with it. And, you know, like obviously it's the place to be now. So you end up selling that out uh, a few years ago, right? Yeah, TCA was the name of the of the brand, and it was uh, May twenty twenty one. So yeah, just over two years ago, we sold that. Was that to an aggregator or to a strategic buyer, or what was it? Who who bought it? It was an aggregator, a U.S. Um, one or a, or a European one. European, European guys. Was that the, like was what were what was your sales volume when you exited? What were you all doing in gross uh, merchandise? When- we we don't we don't reveal everything about it, but um, we were doing like a very healthy seven figures, and um, and we got I, you know this is what we what we started talking about. And it's coming around a little bit now, but what we had was we we had a real a real brand, Kevin. You know, and how some, did you something- build that though? And that's a competitive space. I mean, like you said, Under Armour started, and then every Tom, Dick, and Harry's got compression, something or another, because it, it, there's a low barrier to entry. So, what did what was it that actually, like you just said, you had a real brand? What made it a real brand, and what made it stand out? You know, we, we always think like, what make what are the great brands or Nike, Apple, and we start thinking about the logo and the flashy advertising and stuff. We, we forget one very important point. How did these companies start in the first place, right? They started with a great fucking product. Simple as that. Stop trying to cheat the system, people. Just make a good product. Your brand will build itself. Your business will build itself. No one can be bothered to make a good product these days. I I guess I actually get sick of it. So we talked about when we met in seller sessions, uh, and and um, that was my first ever Amazon event ever, and I was I was even I was even done like I'd sold the previous company. I've got the new the new brands now which I run. Uh, they're going to be they are very successful, but I do I, I have fun with it as well. I'm not like completely um, obsessed with you know making money anymore. So I went to sell a session just for a bit of fun, um, which is how we ended up meeting. Um, but I, I got so people so many questions. They always ask me like, how did you know what to sell? When they find out I'm, you know, on Amazon, how did you find out what to sell? And I just, I'm like confused by the question because that's not how you you did what you know (laughs) and what you would buy. I mean, what you what you would want and what you would buy, right? Yeah, yeah. And made it it good and made it better and good. But I, I don't sit down there and say, "What can I sell?" I sit down there and say, "What do people want? What do people need? And what they can't already get? And what is that a great product?" And and there you go. (laughs) Then you go and sell it. So I feel like people running their business backwards. What can I sell? I just don't get that. So I didn't build an Amazon business. I built a sportswear brand and I just happened to put it on Amazon. That's how I think about it. I mean, I did the same thing in 2015 or similar uh, with when the first Apple Watch came out. There was, uh, I I was going to like, that looks pretty cool. I think I'll buy one of those. And it wasn't quite out yet. And I was like, how do you charge this thing? How do you? What do people do with it? You know, you just got to put a cable and like stick it across the table or on the nightstand. And there I look on Amazon and there's people selling little charging docks, little stands. And back then they're all like they're cheap pieces of crap made out of like bamboo for 10, 15 bucks. And they all look the same or slight variations. And they were selling like crazy. I'm like, I don't want that. If I'm going to spend I don't remember what that watch costs, but if that watch costs like 500 bucks or whatever it was. Why am I going to put it on some chintzy little bamboo $15 stand. Apple has an elegant look to it. You know, it's a sophisticated look. You need like a nice white and silver or some sort of 
you know, colors that match in a black stand. So I developed my own stand. I developed what I want wanted. I had spent like $35,000 or something like that in tooling. This stand had, it would hide all the cables. So it had a bottom which popped out and you wrap the cables around. So there's not all these cables laying all over the, the table. Um, it would charge your iPhone and your, and your, uh, and your watch. It had a built in Bluetooth speaker. Uh, so that you could just, you know, if you're sleeping at night and you want to listen to some music or just whatever, it would tie into the watch or the or, or your phone. It had a little ch- channel on the back to hide everything, and it sat nice and neat on the corner of the desk. and And I put that out at eighty nine dollars in uh, Christmas time, twenty fifteen, and I was selling them like crazy. And everybody else was look using back then. There weren't all these sophisticated tools like there are now. There were a few tools. But people were looking, just let me jump on this bandwagon of being another Me Too product and just make another bamboo stand. These guys are making, you know, 100 grand a month. Let me go do that um, and find a factory that can just make it slightly different. You can't do that. Um, you got to develop. And then the same thing happened with uh, at a dog bowl. Um, and there was this slow feed dog bowl. My dog was eating too fast. And so it was eating its food when I put it in the bowl and just gulp it down. And so then it would get gas or it'd be, you know, burping or whatever. And I was like, this can't be good for the little puppy. So, so I look it up online. They say, yeah, put a tennis ball in the, inside the bowl or something to slow it down. It's got to eat around the tennis ball. Or, But then I look on Amazon, there's this bowl, there's this dog bowl that's a slow feed dog bowl that has a patent on it. And it's like, it's ridged. It's like, looks like a little small little mountain and you just drop the food in there and the dog has to use its tongue to go around the little obstacles to slow them down. I'm like that thing is freaking ugly. That's the ugliest thing I ever saw, a little piece of plastic. I'm gonna, I don't want that sitting on the floor of my house. Um, I want something nice. So I actually developed a really nice bone-shaped bowl with silicone and non-slip rubber and all this stuff and, and came out with that, and it sold like crazy and, became, and created a real brand out of it. And that's what I think, like you just said, is most people are not doing – they're not willing to put in that work or that effort. They're just looking for the quick buck. What can I find on, on Helium 10 that says there's an opportunity, find a supplier, and let's just do it and make a quick buck and be done with it. But if you build a true brand, you create a moat around yourself and you create something that actually has value and someone will pay for. And is your brand now, since you've sold it, have you checked in on it, how, how it's doing? Is it still, are they are they managing it okay? Yeah, I mean, uh, what from what I hear, well, I know for a fact it's doing well because they told me. We had, we had a couple of earnouts and like bits and pieces that, you know, for the couple of years afterwards, which is finished now. But so, yeah, they have to give me those numbers and uh, it's it's, grow, it's grown very, very nicely. Um, so I'm very proud of that, actually, because not all of the brands that were acquired during the, you know, like the rush, the land grab, I think not, not all of them are doing so well, which is why we're seeing so many aggregators acquiring each other and consolidating and some of them are really suffering. So um, I'm very proud that TCA's, do, they do. Uh, I'm actually shocked at how well it's doing. I'm a bit like, <laughs> I've actually realized that I wouldn't have been able to do some of the stuff they've done. Um, are they so, still just Europe, Europe, UK, or they, have they expanded out to the rest of Europe or into uh, US or anywhere? I think they're seeing some really good results in some of the smaller European countries, uh, which which people maybe ignore. I, f- I think like Spain is doing quite well. Um, but yeah, they do, they're, they're selling everywhere. And I think one of the big deals they did was uh, they got on to Decathlon. Decathlon's like a major, major sports retailer here. And I think they're on the Decathlon website now, which is which was one of the big projects they did after I'd sold it. Um, and actually, Chris, who's my number two, he uh, I think he, he can take the credit for most of that project. So he stayed on with the brand and implemented that. So yeah, like TCA is, is actually going a lot better than I thought it could, to be honest. Um, they're adding like, definitely adding a couple of million to the, to the revenue. So yeah, it's doing well, which is very pleasing. So what was it about it? I mean, besides just a quality product, you can have a quality product, but nobody knows about it. Mm. Nobody, it's, and, and that's one of the things that's happening with Amazon now with all this testing they've been doing with reviews. And I'm, I'm all for this, but whether you have a, a product that's been there since 2015, a dog bowl, let's say, and it's been there since 2015, and it's got 27,000 reviews, and it's got this big moat around it that, a newer, better product may come out, but it doesn't stand a chance because it has 10 reviews or 20 reviews. And so people won't give mm. it a chance. And now Amazon's doing all this testing and hopefully it becomes permanent where they don't show the number of reviews anymore. And that will give a, a new product, a better product, a better chance, and will give 
innovate. It's better for the customer. It's better for innovation. Better for the customer. The old school sellers hate it because now their their little moat is gone, uh, and they have to actually do real business. Uh, and it's but what is it besides the quality that made TCA a true brand and made it so good? Is it was it the marketing? Was it the avatar that you were appealing to? Was it mm. how they made them feel when they they did it? They felt that they're part of something, or what? What was it that actually Branding is more than just a quality product and a logo, like you said. What was it that that really helped you create that brand? So I used to, yeah, I did used to think about this a lot. And I guess that the metaphor I always gave was actually, um, well, people used to ask slightly different questions. They'd say, like, what's your USP? And I'd be like, uh, I just say, like, I mean, name me anything that has actually has a USP. Like, unless it's yeah. a patent. I'm not, I'm not a big fan technology. of the US, that USP yeah. statement. Uh, I'm not yeah, I, I, exactly. I think it's a red herring. It goes in the same bucket as the customer is always right for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but I, but I used to think, so if I haven't got a USP, then what, what the hell am I doing? And the metaphor I always thought was like, uh, the business is like a, a rope. You know, the rope has got like so many different threads that wind together. So we're very good at this. We're very good at that. We're very good at this. We're very good. We're slightly better at everything than our competitors. And all overall, you get a nice strong rope, which is which is the strength of the business. So, um, you know, like, and, and so what is it, what makes a brand? I mean, it's like a question that people talk about forever. And the best definition that I like, the one I go by is Jeff Bezos. Uh, he says a brand is what your customers, you know, he says your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. So it's everything you do. Like people hate hearing this because it means it's hard work and you can't just <laughs> like, it's not just the logo. So sadly, it's not just the copywriting. It's not just the imagery, but it's everything you do creates the brand in the mind of your customers. So number one, it is having a great product and that I'll never, I'll never get away from that. We used to spend like weeks, months. I had like designers and product developers from Under Armour, Nike, Lululemon working for me, making my products. To tell me another Amazon business that has got people from the giants of their industry making their products. So we start with a with a great product, and the way part of the way you can get your great product is guess what? You just ask people. <laughs> you just ask your customers what they want, um, and and you have to be clever because, like you know, uh, if you ask them what they want, they might just say a faster horse, like Henry Ford uh, says. So you have to read between the lines. You have to listen carefully. You have to prompt them here and there, and you have to do it carefully. And they will tell you what they're looking for. Then you can go. Sometimes design they it don't know what they want. You look at the. Look at some of the Apple products, you know. Yeah. But people, you know, they, I remember when the, I think it was the first iPhone, I think, came out or something. There's a bunch of articles that came out and said, yeah, this is the latest uh, fad. Uh, mm -hmm. this, this won't last. But sometimes people don't know what they want. So like you said, you have to read between the lines and you have to uh, prompt them right and then create that, basically. There's a, there's a great quote with, from, from the guy we were talking about before, Ogilvy, which I always forget exactly how it goes, but it's like consumers don't know what they want. They don't say what they think and they don't think, <laughs> they don't think what they don't think what they say or something like that. Like basically it's just, you know, you have to be very uh, tactical about the way you engage with them, but you know, ultimately you can do it. So that's, that's one way we did it, right? We speak to customers. Um, you also have to have like a knack for it, right? Like I'm not going to pretend that I have no talent whatsoever, but when I spot a great idea or I hear a customer say something, my brain will latch onto it and I'll, and I'll get that. So, you know, it comes with a bit of, you know, innate ability, like to trust your gut on something as well. But what, but about, can... what, about, what about what you said though, about customers asking them what they want? I mean, in our business right now, one of the big things are, are sites like uh, PickFu, which is a great company, great guys to actually test and, People now are using AI and creating, you know, a hundred different product designs of the latest, coolest dog bowl, and then putting that up there and saying, "Which one of these would you buy?" And then nah. they're then then they're choosing that one and getting feedback. And the people are like, "I like this one because it's got rounded edges, and I like it because of this." And like, yeah. okay, that's the one we're going to do. But the problem with that, in any kind of focus group stuff like that, and whether it's pick food or anything else, is that's great maybe for some brainstorming, and getting some basic ideas. But people, you just said it. What people say. And what they will spend their money on are often two different things. They yeah, may yeah. say this is my favorite, but when it come when it push comes to sub, say give me ten bucks for it. Like no, 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 it's it's not that great. So how yeah. do you how do you get past that when you're doing innovation and branding? And and is it the, just the gut feeling and, and rolling the dice, or how do you how do you do how did you do that, or how do you do that? Mm. 
So good question. I, I mean, I've not codified this in a way that we're trying to talk about now, which I will because this is super valuable. And there'll be companies, I don't even know if people have done this yet. So there's a few things. I mean, number one, if you speak, I speak to people, I like to speak to people one-on-one, -on -one, like customers, rather than in a group, because group dynamics, just you can just throw reality out the window, right? They're just going to start lying, um, conforming to one another. But uh, I speak one-on-one, -on -one, and, and if you hear the same thing three or four times, it's a fairly good indication that, you know, like there's something there. So you can get it with the frequency of, of the same response. Um You've got to be careful not to not to. You've got to write and deliver a question in an open manner. So it's just it's pretty easy. Like, would you buy this? Like, it's not. I don't think a particularly useful question. Like you say, like they could, you know, whatever they say, we don't know until they put their money where their mouth is. Sometimes it's you can. So it's important to phrase questions correctly. Keep them open ended. Don't prompt them. Don't let them think. You know what? It's kind of like um, have the person you're speaking to. Uh, give them any expectation bias of what they think you want to hear, for example. So there's an art to engaging with customers and that, you know, and that side of things. I'm sure there's millions of resources online people can look at for how to effectively do it. But for me, it's something that came natural, like to, to listen to people and try and read between the lines. So that's why I've lent into doing it because I found I was naturally good at it. I mean, one of the things I've done in the past, and this may be, you know, some people may say this is, hey, Kevin, that's maybe a little shady or something. But I, I did this, I had a membership site and I did this and I was testing two different prices. I was like, price for this membership site is going to be $9.95 or $19.95. And I could send out a poll and say, which would you pay for? And everybody's going to say the cheaper price. But I'm like, will they pay for the higher price? So what I did is I set up, I said, we're launching this site and I, I, had a, I did a split test. And that actually took them all the way through the credit card processing. Uh, I didn't actually process the credit card, but they had to enter all their credit card stuff just as if they and hit submit and then they got the thank you and everything. I just didn't actually run the card. And I, I did testing that way. I've done it also for products where I come up with a new product idea. Let's just say it's a, a dog bowl, for example. It wasn't a dog bowl, but just say it's a dog bowl. And I have my own customer list. It's one of the values of having your own customer list. And I will segment that list. If, I, if the list is 10,000, I'll take 1,000 of those people. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it up a special page on my website that's kind of like, it has a, you know, you can, there's some tools where you say you have to have a link to get to this page. So it doesn't just show up naturally everywhere. And I would send out an email to these people and say, and I put the dog wall up, you know, 3d imagery looks like it's real in stock available. To sh you know, I'm not, I don't know if I said it in stock, I said probably, you know, shipping in, in seven days or something like that. And to see if people would actually and did the same thing. Well, how many of these people will go through and actually give me their credit card for it? And I just didn't charge them. And then I come back and I say, sorry, uh, uh, I think one time I told them it was a test, but sometimes that pisses them off. Uh, I think one time I said, oh, we have a shipping shipping delay. Uh, you know, there's a there's a problem with a um, factory or some something, you know, so it's going to be a little bit of delay. I, I forget what I say, but if it doesn't work, then I, I, I'll come back and say something like, uh, sorry, uh, this oversold. You know, we're, we're working on uh, getting some more in or, or whatever it may be. Here, you know, we're not going to charge your car. We didn't charge your card, so don't worry. You're not out of anything. It's nothing to refund. And that I've, I've done testing like that, that actually proves that they want this product. Um, mm. so, so that, that's something that I've done to try to overcome th those obstacles of put your money where your mouth is. Mm. Yeah. I've actually heard that from a few places. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's just actually, I just remember something you mentioned before about the, um, people launch, people want to launch new products on Amazon. They want to get their business, business going. Uh, here's one of my big, you know, my big, um, keys that I think people should try to try to use. And that is rich people shop on Amazon too. And, and how, you know, how do rich people shop, right? Do they go to the shopping mall and look for the cheapest shop? No, they go to the fancy place with all the fancy shops. They want to spend money. So they want to use Amazon. Everyone wants to buy everything on Amazon. We don't want to use any DTC sites. We can't be bothered. But we don't use it for everything because there's a dearth of quality and there's just too much overflow of rubbish. And guess what's the biggest indicator of quality? It's your price. So people need to think about that a little bit more and create really good products and don't be afraid, like you say, to charge for them because prices. I've actually done that too. Exactly what you just said. I did this. Uh, I had a makeup mirror, a little portable makeup mirror for women. That I was selling uh, for several years. I don't sell it anymore, but I was selling for several years. And at Christmas time, I would actually rate everybody else is selling theirs in nineteen ninety five. I would raise the price to twenty nine ninety five, yeah. And then I would put a ten dollar coupon on it, 
uh, you know, one of those clippable coupons on it. So, but when people would come there and they're comparing two different products, they're looking at the night, there's this is 1995 one. Here's mine. My images are good and everything too, but um, this one's 2995. They're like, it must be better. It costs more. Uh, well, I'm on a budget. I can't spend, I'd rather spend the 1995, but well, wait a minute, there's a $10 coupon. So I'm going to get a better quality item for the same price and they would buy mine. Um, and, and mine was better quality, but they don't know that. And then they can't touch it and feel it and hold it or whatever. But that's, that's the psychology of, mar of marketing that, that most people don't think about. Um, and um, I agree with you. I've, I've done that with bully sticks. I've, I've told this story many times. It was in my newsletter and a couple of places where I sold everybody selling 30 bully sticks in a bag for 30 bucks on Amazon. I sold three in a box for $55. Um, and everybody just thinks it's always always about the cheapest price on Amazon. And it's absolutely not. In some categories, in some keywords, it's difficult to compete uh, if if you're not competing on price. But there's a lot of opportunities in a lot of spaces where it's it's not price based. Absolutely. And you know the thing with the dog uh, treats is there's even another element which came to mind on top of that for me, which is the customer, i.e. The, the human buying it, will will never actually know how good or bad that thing was for its dog. Because it can't really get the feedback, right? So there's yeah, actually more. Exactly. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's more yeah. uncertainty, right? When you're going to put something in the mouth of a child or a dog that you're responsible for, and again, do I really want to put the cheapest thing in my dog's mouth? No, you're I, appealing I, I, to I, you're I, selling to the human. It's just it's the same old thing of McDonald's with playgrounds. You know, they put a playground in there so the kids say they want to go to McDonald's. It's you're 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 not selling to the you're you're selling to not necessarily the consumer of the product, but the buyer of the product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we've seen that as well um, in the gifting space as well. So there's different, but yeah, this is basic. This is marketing 101. I mean, it made me laugh a little bit when we were at seller sessions because you could see the shift happening away from, there's definitely a shift happening now with the Amazon world, which is away from the short termism, away from the hack mentality towards brand. Everyone's saying brand, right? Brand, 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 which is why it's just becoming like ruined the word, but which is fine. <laughs> but but people, like, they, they're saying that that's the mantra, but no, most people don't understand what that means. Well, exactly. They don't, they don't, they don't quite get it. And, and some of the content, you know, is pretty, this is, you know, some pretty basic marketing branding 101 which everyone, you've got to start somewhere, but I feel like the Amazon world is so far behind. Um, but that's, you know, that's like a, a principle that I have, which is, take, you know, I try to work out what I'm good at. And then I think, well, where is, where is what I'm good at going to have the most effect? Where am I going to have the biggest impact? And that's not necessarily the place where everyone else who's good at what I do is playing. I want to find a playground where people that aren't good at what I do are playing because then I can stand out a bit more. So for me, that was the beauty of Amazon was like, okay, everyone here is playing a price war, cheap commodity game. And I'm going to do, I'm going to pretty much do the opposite. And that's a lot of the stuff with TCA is what, that's what we did. I mean, my, my, um, my titles sometimes were like six words, six word product title, like women's supreme running leggings, what TCA. Boom. That's the title. No keyword stuffing, no nothing. Do you know what that looks like to a customer? It looks like, damn, these guys are confident. <laughs> you know, they don't need to, they're not begging for sales. They're confident in what they do. That sounds like an Under Armour or a Lululemon or a Nike type of title, not an Amazon title. So that's how we did it. And, and it st can still work today. So now you're building another brand, right? Uh, at least one. Yeah. We've got two or three. Some pottery uh, thing or something on. like that. Or what was it? What is it? We're, we're, we're in the creative space at the moment. So I um, after I sold, I mean, I love sports, but like when I've been wearing my own sportswear for 10 years, I was actually sick to death of it. So <laughs> it, was a, it was actually like a relief to sell the brand and start wearing jeans again. But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative guy. I love creating. You can see behind me, I got the guitar, got the piano. I got some artwork back there as well. So... I just thought, let me do a business about something that I actually want to do myself. Um, so yeah, so so um, the brands that we're doing now are all in a creative space, um, which just makes it fun to work on. So what are those launched, or you're still in the development stage on those? Uh, launched. We've got. I've got. I've got other ideas um, which are yet to launch, but sometimes you don't want to split your focus too many different ways. Some kind of wondering whether I launch more now or just try and focus on what we have. Are you doing it the same way where you're going after more of the premium 
high quality market in a commoditized industry or are you doing it a little bit differently this time? Um, no, this time is completely different. This time we're trying, this time we're actually running very much a dual business, Amazon and D2C. So uh, that's like a new skill set that, that I'm learning is, is more of the D2C uh, side of running a business because TCA was, was uh, almost all Amazon. Um, we didn't challenge on the on the D2C side. Um, so yeah, we're doing both of those things. And, you know, Amazon, again, it's pros and cons, right? So the pro is you can get a product in front of everybody very quickly, very easily. The con is it's a search, um, you know, it's a search tool. So if you put something completely new on there that no one's ever heard of, the chances of them finding it are low because they don't know what they're looking for. They can't search for it yet because they don't know it exists, right? So um, that you have to weigh up that when you're using Amazon as well, because you want to be innovative and launch new things that haven't been seen yet, but you have to try and still capture some demand that's already existing. That's so, what a lot of people are using TikTok for now, for product discovery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, exactly. That's that type of stuff that we're actually trying to learn and, and it's like a new skill set for us at the moment. Yeah, there's people right now using, I mean, TikTok's got their own shop in, in the UK and they're doing some testing in the US and they got a lot, a lot of stuff coming there where they're setting up their own fulfillment networks and everything because they realize this, that TikTok is a, a great place for product discovery. They're like, why should we be sending this off to somebody's Shopify site or to, uh, to Amazon when we could just do this ourselves and take those margins? But So they're, they're working heavily on that. But there's people that, one of the TikTok tactics actually is that to get something going, like you said, on Amazon, if you can't get product, if you... Don't, they don't know you exist and something new and innovative, it's hard to find it. Amazon has some programs that try to help push that out there a little bit, but um, you give up more points for being in those programs too. But what TikTok, what someone's doing on TikTok is they, they got really smart. They went out and got five influencers. I think this is Paul Harvey that actually uh, uh, recommended this. Get five influencers to actually prom to create a UCG, uh, user-generated content video of your product and then post that on their link and then you run ads using their against their using their boost basically boosting their their content, but you run that to a small audience. So if if it's a small audience of say five or ten thousand people, and those five or ten thousand people, because there's five different influencers, five different videos all featuring your product, and running to this small audience, it starts showing up in all their feeds mm. uh, constantly, and they and they see, start seeing other people doing it. It's this very small subset, so they're like, well, I just. I just saw uh, Kevin's video and I just saw Mike's video. I just saw Susan's video. Man, this must be a hot product. Let me go search for it on Amazon. And then mm. that creates a, a demand. They go and they're like, this is pretty cool. Let, let me, I'm going to buy it. And then it creates this flywheel and then you expand it out from there. And you can actually almost force product discovery, at least right now, the way the algorithm works by doing stuff like that, which is which is pretty cool little technique. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. And that's the merging of the worlds that we're seeing, D2C and Amazon. You know, in 2012, in 2015, uh, for you as well, Amazon is a dirty, it's a dirty word. Brands don't, even now today, brands turn their nose up. They don't want to be there. They don't want to be associated with it. And that's slowly changing. Um, and it will, you know, eventually that will, I think, disappear almost entirely. But, you know, where there's this snobbery around Amazon, that's opportunity for people. Um, so, you know, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to watch that merging of the D2C world and the Amazon world. And it's not so hard anymore to drive people to Amazon. They trust it. They, you know, like we said, they all want to buy things there. So yeah, I think, um, yeah, we're, we're interested, very interested in TikTok and, and the TikTok shop, like you say, because they're banning all the links, aren't they, to, to outbound to Amazon or whatever. Uh, but like, I don't think it really matters to be honest. So what 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 else are you working? You just got these brands. You got anything else in the in the uh, the oven? I um, <laughs> I mean, I literally just make music, Kevin. <laughs> All right, I see the I, uh, piano behind you there. So I was learning. I was playing the piano last night. I got the guitar on the go. I I sing as well. I love making music. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be a musician or an artist. But it's a passion. And you know what's funny, like with, you know, like an entrepreneurial type of person is your passions tend to start to turn into businesses eventually. So uh, that's why I started the, these like creative product brands is because I thought, well, I'm already passionate about it. So we'll, we'll do it that way. 
Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I like messing around, like creative, like doing some art um, and I love writing. I've been, I've been writing. I tried to get a blog going, but didn't really pursue it. I wrote some stories. All of these things are little passion projects. Uh, I love dancing. I'm going to dance class later tonight. But I, I have a feeling that one of them or two of them might start to look like funnel itself into like some kind of business because that's just what I naturally do. So it's watch it's a watch this space for like what else I might do. But I'm a physical product guy at heart, right? Like I just love a good product. You know, you know, you know. Once you know how to do it as well, this is something that's so interesting, Kevin. Like the second time around, it's so easy. Starting a business the first time round is like you think you for some reason we all do it, we all reinvent the wheel and we learn how to do everything. <laughs> but like but I, we, we maybe you need to, maybe it's not you can't just get a mentor or follow a playbook, but the second time you do it, I was like, Oh my god, like this is so easy. So I think people should remember that as well. Like people who's on their first business right now, it's hard work, it's a grind, it was for me also. But there's a very big difference between the first time you do something and the second in anything, and building a business is the same. So that's what I found and um, having a bit more fun with it now. That's awesome. Well, Frankie, if people wanted to find out more about you or to, uh, to check you out, what you're up to, uh, check out your blog or whatever uh, that hasn't been updated in a while or whatever it is, uh, how would they do that? Uh, Instagram. I'm, I'm called The Urban Artist. The Urban Artist. Um, so I, I use that mostly to, you know, share, share, my, share my work there, any, if it's writing or anything else. Um, and, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, which LinkedIn is kind of a funny place. So don't take myself too seriously on there, but, um, but yeah, I'd love to connect with people on LinkedIn or, or Instagram. Um, yeah, man, I'd love that. Cool, man. I appreciate your time today. It's been uh, great chatting with you. Kevin, it's always a pleasure. The King, the King is here. The King, <laughs> the, the King in the house. Cool, man. I'm sure we'll see each other or be chatting again uh, soon. Thanks, man. Great discussion this week with Frankie talking about branding and how you figure out how to actually create a true brand on Amazon. Great story and some great insights and some great resources for everybody. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. We'll be back again next week with another awesome episode. We're going to be talking about sourcing in India and some amazing opportunities that you probably don't even know about when it comes to sourcing in India. Even if you don't want to direct all your sourcing over there, just even switching 10 or 20 percent can make huge, huge differences. So look forward to that in next week's episode. Before we leave today, our discussion today between me and Frankie reminded me of a quote from Dan Kennedy. Dan Kennedy is one of the greatest copywriters. Uh, he's still alive uh, of our, our generation, and he's just amazing stuff. But one of the quotes that he said is, marketing is about behavioral psychology and math. Marketing is about behavioral psychology and math. I couldn't agree more. Have a great week. We'll see you next Thursday.